What is up, you cheeky little tinkers? You, uh, you fellow political nerds. You sexy, satirical bastards. Uh, well, it's Wednesday, which means it's time for the solo show, of which there were two last week. Two solo shows in one week. You lucky, lucky people. Uh, I mean, you know, if you enjoy politics-y, satirical, ranty content. If you don't, then, you you know, you're probably not feeling quite so lucky. <laughs> probably a bad week for you. Like, oh, what the fuck? He's done two? Two? The oh, fuck out of the way. I'm trying to listen to cereal, you know? But honestly, like, you, may, you may as well act like you're into this, or I'll do four. Um, really ruin your week. Oh, actually, before we get into it this time, I just want to make a super quick mention of the Patreon. Because uh, it's all getting quite cool on there now. And uh, oh, and then, you know, then we'll jump into this. Then we'll start roasting some shit, getting into it. Um, then we'll then we'll skip the foreplay and jump straight to the penetration. We will formally begin the political neutering of our opponents with the usual cold, clinical, surgical sarcasm gasms you fucking booge little influencer bastard so i just i want to get this out there first right here, here we go um did you know that you can get every episode of this show two days early i don't know how many of you know that because like sometimes i listen to podcasts but i don't get all the way through them so i just want to make sure people are aware of this shit because i normally talk about it at the end you can also get right so two days early for all of the shows you can get the invites to london meetups right the next one is next thursday by the way thursday the 27th of october in london more about that at the end of this uh this episode um you could join our discord chat where we talk shit about tories all day and you know tear our hair out and generally you know laughing hysterics at the goddamn state of the country the state of the state as it were uh you could get your name credited at the end of the show like this one like i'm going to at the end of this episode um there's a monthly skype call for premium tier backers on patreon that will start in november you get to join my binfluencer cult because it is a cult and i am looking for total commitment and i cannot promise it won't all end in some sort of, you know, fucked up ceremony where I give a sermon and you're all dosed up on intoxicating substances. That is almost word for word what is written in the Patreon goals. <laughs> like it started like, you know, if we get 10 backers, we'll meet up in London, have a few beers. So that's what's happening. You know, we're at 13 now. Next week, we're meeting up. And then I think the next goal was get to 25. And then I'm going to do a full on Sunday sermon or some shit. <laughs> anyway, as I say, before we get into this, you know, proper. I just want to make sure people know about this stuff because like, I know what I'm like, right? I get listening to a podcast. I get 50 or 60 percent into the episode and very, very rarely do I listen right to the end? You know? Because there's lots going on. You know, life gets in the way. I rarely get to the end of the show, like, of, of anything. I'm a parent. Maybe you are too. I don't know. Like, it's hard to stay focused on shit, isn't it? When you're a parent. Like, being a parent is like a sort of shit form of ADHD. <laughs> it's just... Just cannot stay focused on any one thing for any extended period of time because you just i don't know you just rarely have 55 minutes to sit and listen to anything from start to finish you know and then what you you, you press stop and exhale like ah <sighs> like okay that was a nice audio experience that has now completed. I shall now process what I've just listened to and reflect upon it. No! <laughs> like, if, you, if you're listening to this and you're a parent, you will know that having young children means 
your opportunities to consume information, they happen in bursts. Not, you know, prolonged hours of time. There are no one-hour windows in this life. That ship has sailed. Netflix should ship box sets like um like it should say yeah here's the watcher it's seven episodes long each one is one hour and it's oh, oh wait no you're a parent oh okay yeah no click here scroll down yeah yeah no uh, okay that this is the parent section and what we did is we, we took the total length of the box set and we divided it into 3200 snippets and each snippet is only three minutes long. So you can watch it. And by the time you finish one snippet episode, your kid can shit herself and throw a bowl of Weetos all over the floor. And you can get distracted and have to clean it up and, uh, and whatever. And it's fine. It's just, you know, little episodes for parents who only have like a tiny fraction of time to, to focus on one thing. You know, listening to a whole episode or a whole box set episode you know podcast or box like when you're a parent like i'm supposed to make it through to the end of each episode like how how do you do that when you're a parent when you when you have kids man like it's not even an episode thing it's not to do with consuming box sets or podcasts like like you could catch up with a friend and he would be like Anyway, yeah, it's so good to see you again, mate. You know, the f the funniest thing happened on holiday. You'd be like, oh, oh, really? Yeah, so, like, we we was in this cafe in, in Magaliv. Oh, all right. Then your kid interrupts, like, Daddy, Daddy, look at, look at my belly. Yes, I, 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 no, I see it. I see it, Jacob. Sorry, you were saying. Yeah, yeah, so we're in this bar sort of thing, and, and Jody goes in. Daddy! Daddy, look! Look at my belly! Yes, I can see it, and, and it's amazing. Sorry, sorry, you were saying, like, Jody, Jody goes in the bar? Yeah, so he goes in, and he orders a beer, right? But the bit... that you're not looking, Daddy! Why are you not... Orders this beer, but the beer... And then, you know, you're trying to listen, but it's fucking impossible. And you're interrupted and you can't concentrate and your mate doesn't get it because he's a childless fucking bit part in his own life story. Drenched in arrested development and cannot possibly understand how much you 100% want to hear his story. But at the same time, do not have the patience to listen to this slow, drawn out non-versation coming out of his fucking noise hole. <laughs> And it's just, Daddy, Daddy, look at my belly. And he goes into a bar. And, Daddy, look, Daddy. And he orders the beer. And finally, you explode. You're like, Lily, can you fucking speed this up? Can you speed this the fuck up? Give me the headlines. Give me the fucking bullet points. Jody walks in the bar and, and what? Or orders a beer? And, and it, it was called something funny? Or he was served by someone he'd had terrible sex with the night before? Or what, like the, the barman was his doppelganger? What? What the fuck happened? The, 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 um, the, the second one. Right. Fucking amazing. Thank you for that. Jesus, aid. Jesus. <laughs> but this is the thing, like, when I used to work at Sky, there was a guy there who was giving me advice, like I was about to become a father. And his advice was like, when you become a father, you, you, you know, I think the big thing is you become more patient. And it's like the total opposite. <laughs> like I'm patient with my kids. But everyone else needs to get to the fucking point, stat. <laughs> Becoming a parent makes you, you know, more patient. And understanding and uh, and loving and no, I'm afraid not. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm afraid that is untrue. I love my kids, but then I'm all out. That's yeah. I actually think it's made me uh, meaner being a parent. I might be the only person in the world who had a child that I love. But it makes every like me hate everyone else more. <laughs> Does that sound weird? <laughs> Most people are like, yeah. When I once I had a kid, you know, it all came together. It all life made sense to me, and I just you know appreciated everyone around me so much more. Like, I'm not sure that's me. I'll give you an example, guys. Like, I I was telling my girlfriend this is a while back now. 
I was telling her how, you know, before you have kids, if you hear a baby crying somewhere, it's just like, you know, annoying. That's before you have children. Hear a baby crying. It's just an annoying sound. Pisses you off a bit. You're like, oh, God, that baby crying is grating on me. Like, can't they shut it up? What the fuck? This is my day off. I'm going into London. I have to sit here and listen to this shit. Oh, you know, that's before you have kids. Then after you have kids, you're out, right, on your day off, on a train, and you hear someone else's kids crying. Then you're like, oh, yeah. Oh, that is the shit. Someone else is having a hard time. <laughs> it's not me. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> It's nice to hear someone else struggling while I'm not. Oh, yeah. Because it's sort of double hammers at home that I have a day off from the hard shit. <laughs> you know, you see, meaner. It's made me meaner. Anyway, where the fuck was I? Uh, Patreon shit. Right. So sometimes I don't get to the end of podcasts uh, or indeed points. Um. But anyway, I'm just mentioning, you know, this Patreon shit up front because, you know, if you don't get to the end of the podcast, you would never know about it. Right. So so the Patreon starts at three pounds a month. And I always say, if you're not in a position to back the show via Patreon, that is cool. But just do me a favor. If you are enjoying them, you know, these these prickly pods of an often punk politics persuasion, then pick a friend. A lot of alliteration going on today. Pick a friend, right? Think in your mind right now of one friend. Or if you have no friends, then one enemy. Someone sarcastic, nihilistic. Someone who, you know, like me, takes perverse pleasure in being told how shit everything is. Like, yeah, have you got someone like that in your life? And then what you do is you click the little upwards arrow on this podcast player the little share button, if you like. And you paste a link to the podcast into your WhatsApp chat with this person. And you say this, right? This is what you say, guys. Here we go. This is how you help the podcast to grow. You say, hey, Dave, I know we haven't uh, DM'd in a while. We normally just sparingly communicate on the uh, group chat by way of the language of shit memes. And even that's rare nowadays, since you knocked up Samantha's friend and had to double your shifts at the tire and exhaust to support your illegitimate, sinful family, Dave. But I know you're into politics, and I remember you always enjoyed a bit of a laugh, too. Anyway, Dave, I've found this podcast, and I think it's right up your alley. Something to kick back and laugh at, you know, perhaps while you're on a break at the tire and exhaust place. If you're not too tired or exhausted, lol. See you next time, Dave. Love to the families. And tap send. That is what you send. Or something along those lines would be perfect, I think. Basically, if you can't back the pod with Patreon, 100% understand. But if you are enjoying the show, do me a solid and share me amongst your friends like the filthy, charmless and riddled harlot that I am. Uh, anyway, that's it. That's it for that nonsense. Let's get into it. So, as ever... Uh, oh, God, I can't talk today. As ever, lots going on. There is talk that the Bank of England might sell off uh, all the bonds that they bought two weeks ago, which, for anyone that's not familiar, this means that the same place the government go to to sell bonds, to raise money, right... Which is like, you know, invest in Britain. Give us 30 grand of your money and you'll get X back every year in interest. And then you're 30 grand back in 10 years. Like That is a bond, right? The same place they go to to sell that shit and raise money, the Bank of England had to panic buy from. To steady the markets. Do you remember that? Because bonds were tanking in value. Because uh, everyone was like, uh, the UK has lost the plot. I am not investing there. Fuck that shit. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to give away a load of tax cuts. Oh, really? Uh, how how are you going to pay for that? Oh, with these uh, magical growth beans. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I'm out. Uh, that was basically what it was like. So that was the uncosted mini budget that happened. Just a you know little thing. You might have uh, might have heard about it. Um, 
And the Bank of England bought a shit ton of bonds to synthesize demand in that market to keep the price up, right? And then to balance the books, right? Versus the tax cuts. Uh, and they hiked interest rates uh, to steady to steady the market. Get, get, like, get more of that mortgagey loan money coming back in. Build up the treasury is how I've interpreted it. And so then what? Uh, like buying the bonds stopped the bond market crashing, which saved pensions, right? Because pensions invest in bonds. And there was a, you know, a lot of talks that pen the, the entire pension sector was about to collapse. Um, but as a result of doing this, you know, bond buying frenzy, uh, they raised interest rates. Uh, and also to back up like the, the uncosted tax cuts. Um, so anyway, now mortgages are getting very expensive. I, I know I'm going a little bit slow here and a little bit frantic, but generally, like, are you with me, right? Are you still with me, guys? Listeners, you understand what I'm getting at here. Mini budget, chaos, pensions almost collapsed, loads of bond buying, and now <laughs> the Bank of England are like, well, okay, I guess that's settled. Let's flog them all off again. <laughs> like, Time to fire sale these bonds. Get rid of them. <laughs> Which is going to tank the value of bonds again. Because you're flooding the market. And so then to compensate that, they're going to raise interest rates further. Right. So interest rates are already high now. Mortgage is already incredibly expensive. And so this was announced, I think, last night. Um, and let me just read to you what Richard Murphy, professor of accounting practice, at Sheffield University had said this is this morning uh, and it is a bit dark um, he said the Bank of England has declared economic war on the people of the UK I am angry disgusted and outright fearful of the consequences of the Bank of England's bond selling policy it is designed to crush the people of the UK whoa Let's lighten things up a little bit there, Richard. Jesus. He's outright fearful of the consequences of this. It's designed to crush the people of the UK. I'm sure like earlier on, he was saying about the Bank of England having no mandate to cause mass homelessness, which was even more like, you know. But maybe he's deleted that one because I, I can't seem to find it now. It seems to have gone. But like that is kind of what's happening. And it makes me ask the question, like, do they need to sell these bonds? Do we need to raise interest rates further? Like, what the fuck is going on? Like, a professor of accounting practice at Sheffield University is like, what the fuck are you doing? You're going to fuck the mortgage sector. You're going to force people to exit their homes. And then what? Like, do we... Do we all make our way to the Terror Dome? You know? <laughs> or do we all live in abandoned shops and derelict warehouses? You know? I'm going to be real, like, when I read this, I was like, finally, an upside to living in such a shitty town. <laughs> finally, you know, all the derelict, abandoned, disused buildings. All the shit we used to drive past, and we'd be like, oh, what an eyesore. In six months, we're going to be like, where are you staying? Blockbusters. Oh, OK, yeah, cool. Yeah, no, we're, we're in Woolworths. Yeah, it's right, right next to the old cinema. The disused, abandoned old cinema. Is that still there? Yeah, yeah. Just about. It's really popular as well. Someone hooked the boiler up to a streetlight. So, you know, it's it's not much, but it's home. <laughs> it's like... Like, how about that? Like, this whole time, I thought Aldershot was a shithole. Underinvested in and sat decaying for two decades. Turns out, no. It was way ahead of its time. <laughs> People used to decry towns and districts for their gentrification, didn't they? Bringing upmarket bakeries and craft ales and food markets to an area. The rents would go up. House prices would go up. No more, you know? Now, towns are going to get rated positively on how decrepit and shit they are. Like, have you been to Notting Hill? Yeah, so it, Notting Hill is awful, you know? Everything is clean and caked in security guards. You cannot squat for the life of you. Like, I'll tell you what, though. Try Aldershot. Aldershot is a sea 
of empty offices, disused shops from the 90s. You are going to love it. It's like... It was 20 years ahead of its time. I realise that now. A big part of me wonders, like, what is this all for? You know? Why are they hiking interest rates? Why can't we just say, well, you know what? This is how much we have in the bank. This is how much it costs to run the country. And if we're running at a loss, we either magic up some more magic money or, you know, maybe we do have to rethink about how we finance some public services, you know? Maybe, maybe that's not a popular thing to say, but maybe we do. Because if you don't think of it in that way, if you don't look at it logically, you know, like bal actually balancing the books, cost benefit, investment, bonds, the money you've got coming in versus the money you're putting out. Like if you don't start to think of it logically, you kind of lead yourself down a conspiracy cul-de-sac, I think. All that's left then is like, you know, is this all some big reset or land grab by the elites or whatever, you know? And then you start, you know, looking on the internet and there's plenty there to kind of support that if you wanted it to support it, that theory. Like it wouldn't take much to get some confirmation bias flowing, I don't think. Is this part of a big reset? Are the elites trying to take our homes from us? You know? I mean, just off the top of my head, like I remember a news story. This was about, must have been a couple of years ago. I think it was JP Morgan or Goldman's or someone, one of the big American banks. I read about how they were buying up residential property. And normally I think they invest in, you know, new developments, projects, programs, buildings, businesses, ventures, hedge funds. But this was different. This was them going, yeah um homes now you know that was the big swoop they were doing just rock up in limos down new build boulevard you know and just hank and his family are checking out whether this new build this place whether the garage the garage has enough space for him and his prius and his fixed gear bikes you know he's like I like the look of this place, Jan. I think we could be happy here. I think the kids, you know, picture them running around in the yard. I think this place is going to be good for us as a family. You know, they're sizing it up, thinking whether they should make an off. Then a limo pulls up. <laughs> Guy leans out. He's like, yeah, I'll take the whole street. You know? <laughs> poor, poor Hank's like, whoa. Whoa, hang on there, buddy. I haven't even put in my offer yet. And the estate agent's like, all right, uh, wh what's your offer? He's like, oh, well, it's it's on at 400,000, right? So, uh, I don't know, 400,000? And the banky cunt in the car <laughs> leans out again. He's just like, yeah, I'll pay 600,000 for each house. And uh, I'll make it 650 if you punch this guy in the face. <laughs> and poor, poor Hank's like, what? You can't do it, smack, you know? Anyway, I can't remember if it was like JP Morgan or Goldman's or someone, but that was definitely happening. That was like last year, maybe two years ago. Big banks buying up standard residential homes. And now we're like over here, the Bank of England are like, yeah, fuck your mortgage. <laughs> fuck the five years you stayed in, the holidays you didn't go on. Like, do you remember how everyone was like, well, if you just you know, hold back on every discernible life expense for 10 years, you could get on the ladder too. <laughs> and so then, I don't know, maybe you did. Maybe you didn't get that new iPhone. Maybe you cancelled your Netflix. You sold your car. You walked to work. You didn't eat. In fact, you burst into flames if you so much as looked at an avocado. <laughs> for years. And finally, you got your foot in the door. And now the Bank of England are like, fuck you. <laughs> 
Time to roll credits, guys. Show's over. That's it. And there's still some of us here going, no, nah, they wouldn't do that, would they? I mean, even if they do, like, maybe there's... Maybe there's some way we can... Hang on. You know, if I just take a second job. If we just cancel the car lease. Maybe there's some way we can just cling on and make it through. Like, we're like ants on a patio slab thinking we can reason our way out of getting blasted away by the hose gun. <laughs> Maybe if I just do this and just click... And then, the you know, garden hose... Smashed away the other side of the garden. We are mere months away from that call, man. We're going to call up RBS or NatWest or someone. Yeah, I'd like to remortgage. They're going to be like, okay, well, you know, this is going to sound weird, but your house is now too expensive for you. It's £1,700 a month. So it's doubled. It's too expensive for you, but it's also simultaneously too cheap for you to sell. <laughs> like what? <laughs> You can't afford to stay in your house, but you also cannot afford to leave. God bless capitalism. Like, well, yeah, this this makes perfect sense. Like, if that happens, I swear to God, I am just going to apply for the shittiest job in Australia. Fuck my girlfriend's reservations. I'm just going to zip my disobedient... But I don't want to move somewhere I've never been, girlfriend, in a suitcase, push her through check-in at Gatwick, and leave this fucking country for good. You know? Scrimping and saving for years. You get on the ladder, and then find, finally, you got a house, and then washed away. Fuck that shit. And let the brown letters pile up. I don't care. You still owe the bank some money. I could not give two shits if I grew another asshole. Mr. Thompson, you owe us £500,186 outstanding for the mortgage that soared in price through no fault of your own. Mr. Thompson, your HSBC debt is now at 600000 Please make payment immediately. Just letter after letter piling up in a house I was ordered to vacate. But now it's being used by two financially broken families as a squat who are burning the letters to keep warm. You know, fuck that. Meanwhile, I'll be off in some suburb of Melbourne with a beer in my hand, you know, and an angry girlfriend. She'll be like, I fucking hate it here. <laughs> but I'll be beaming. <laughs> like, that's what I'm going to do if this shit really hits the fan. I swear. I mean, how how angry can she realistically be? How long could she stay pissed off at me if I traffic her across international borders against her will, ostensibly imprison her in a foreign country, isolated from her friends and family? How long can you be angry about that for? I mean, it sounds bad, right? But then how could she stay angry if every time she flicks on BBC World News... The footage she sees of the UK is people getting evicted and thrown out in the street by fucking private bank police. Like, bang, bang, bang. Asset protection, sir. You got to get your shit and get out. Like, <laughs> She flicks over to Sky, you know, Dermot Monaghan's on, giving a bullet at the British government announced emergency measures today designed to regain control of its spiralling debt by slashing funding to prisons and hospitals. You know, like, girlfriends standing there watching this? Convicts getting out after four weeks because they slashed prison and probation budget so much. Murderers getting out on four weeks on tags, but not monitored. You know, because, like, they won't bother monitoring specific breaches of tag curfew. What they'll do is, you know, they'll take... All 5,000 that are out on tag. And Serco will average the number of breaches. And if they get it under that for a period of 12 weeks, then they get their Serco bonus. But that's it. But there'll be no real management 
of prisoners out on license or reprimands when they break curfew. It's just, you know, bonus or no bonus <laughs> for, for Circo. But that's the sort of stupid shit that'll be happening. People getting violently murdered for a loaf of bread on Edgware Road because the perpetrator was like one of those let out on a new Circo tag averaging system designed to save the public purse an extra like fucking, what? Four thousand pounds a year. Like it'll be something hilariously paltry like that. You know, how do we save money, guys? Well, we could save up to four thousand pounds a year if we give this to Circo. Hand it over and someone gets murdered, but four grand lands on the prison's balance sheet. Immediately wiped out by three times over inflation. But still, they would be like, well, you know, every little helps, you know, trim the fat, cut the waste, right? <laughs> Extra four thousand pounds on the balance sheet. I think I think we're doing something right. <laughs> There'd be people like you can't put a price on a human life. Well, clearly you can. We've saved four grand. I mean, that woman got butchered to fuck. But, you know, four, four grand, right? Glass is half full. <laughs> Save as much money as possible in every little slash to the bare minimum corner of public services. That will be the MO. And people will be like, every little helps. Every little £4,000 here and £2,000 there will help. And, you know, that's what it will be like. Every little helps. Reasoned Chancellor Hunt. Think big picture. He continued as he pocketed £4,000 in net savings, walking past this shivering Edgware Road body in this Victorian yet somehow dystopian scene. I mean, how angry could she be? Let's just get back on point here. How, how pissed off could she stay? Could she maintain that level of anger at me for moving us all to Australia, railroading us over there? If she was watching that sort of shit unfold here, you know, like what sort of sane person could be in Australia in the sun with a can of Victoria Bitter, maybe a pool out the back, 25 degrees, everyone around you super friendly with, I don't know, reasonable rent or mortgage or whatever in a suburb of Melbourne? Who could be in that scenario and then watch Sky News like, the working and middle class of Britain are now an impoverished, subservient underclass who survive only via meal tickets rewarded when one of the bigger males beats his friend to death in one of the new pleb death tournaments in the Emperor Boris Johnson Coliseum. Who's watching that and going, oh man, I miss home. Like, <laughs> so could she maintain the pissed offness? I don't, I think I'd be all right. Anyway, so they're selling off these bonds and the interest rates are going up again. And uh, and it's a scary time. And you have to look for the positives, right? And I suppose one positive of all this is that maybe, maybe societally, it's a good thing. Like, could it be that? Like, if you think big picture for a minute, try and look at the upsides here, right? So, we bought our house for 350 But after this incoming crash, which seems all but fucking inevitable now, right? But the value of this house, let's say it goes down to 200 or some shit. I know that seems like a huge drop now, but if this turns into a global depression... You know, I don't know how low it's going to go. But let's just say it did drop by that much. If this house, house is uh, worth 200000 but wages stay the same, you could maybe make a case then that this whole shit is a good thing because houses are brought back down to the level where, like, an average person, an average income, like, you know, a postman, a teacher, an estate agent, might be able to afford one, Right? And I think we all agree that houses are too fucking expensive. So, like, is this that? You know, 
are we headed for a colossal crash in house prices because the whole thing is just too overcooked now? And so maybe a colossal crash in house prices could be a good thing. You know, it is like a big reset, but maybe not in quite the conspiracy theory way that I was alluding to earlier. I mean, you can tell, <laughs> you can tell I'm desperate for a silver lining here, right? Lose the family home, get inje ejected into a, a life of red letters and squatting. And, you know, I'm here barrel scraping the shit like, well, yes, yeah, uh, you know, seems bad, guys. But maybe think of it, think of it like this. Maybe I'm just some sort of heroic martyr of capitalism, selflessly taking one for the team. Like, maybe that's my story. It's no, it's not that I should have got a 10-year fixed when they were on the table. Were they ever on the table? I feel like they used to do 10-year fixed. Maybe it's not that I should have been more prudent. <laughs> Maybe it's not that. Maybe I should have saved more in my savings account. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's that I'm a heroic martyr of capitalism. Yeah, taking one for the team. So that then when the reset happens, you know, the rest of you can afford a house. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe the statues of bulls in New York and the Duke of Wellington outside the Bank of England. Maybe they should be replaced, dear listeners, with a Christ-like iron thing of me. Shirtless. Arms out. Down on my knees. You know, full Christ pose. <laughs> As the rain bleats against my chest. You know, and then the working classes of the future are shielded from said rain. You know, they're hiding. They're, they're behind my back, shielded from the rain of capitalism. <laughs> Sheltered from the misery and chaos that rains down on, on me, the martyr. You know, I'd, I'd be comfortable with that. Anyway, what, what else is happening? Food prices have gone up at their fastest rate in 40 years. There really is no good news at the moment. Fuck me. Everything's getting so expensive. Mortgages. Rents. Sometimes people are doubtful about rents getting expensive. I had a quick exchange with a friend last night. And she was like, um, she was like, I think this is, you know, weirdly where being a renter you know, with fewer responsibilities, maybe comes in quite handy. And I'm like, ah, you know, renters maybe going to be less affected by this, I think was, you know, I guess it's like, you know, because everyone's freaking out about mortgages, then if you're a renter, then, you know, maybe it won't impact you because nobody's really talking about renters right now. But it's funny, like, it's like, that's the misunderstanding. I think this is a misassumption for want of a better word. It's this idea that, you know, landlords are these, what, like uh, 18th century land barons, you know, a big fat old bastard with a fur coat who surveys his estate and visits the hard up mill workers and they can't afford to pay him his seven gold coins. So he has his way with three of them. Like this idea that they're, f you know, full on landowners walk around the fur coat, you know, the big medallion thing around, you know, landlords are usually on. They're not that they're, they're on two year fixed deals and three year fixed deals. They're, they're very like, you know, they like flexibility. In case they want to release cash from this flat or that house and get equity out and reinvest or sell up or, you know, get a better deal. And here's the terrifying bit. When these two year fixed come up for renewal in the next few weeks and months, your rent is going to double. But just because the conversation right now is about mortgages, don't get it twisted. This is going to bleed out into the buy-to-let market and savage the rental sector. This is going to be like another pandemic, you know? But like the first wave is going to hit people like me. We're going to remortgage our house, and I think we will fail the affordability checks. I mean, that will almost certainly happen, unless, unless the fucking Patreon takes off. <laughs> it's going to be like, but, but, but I own this place. 
I have kids. You, you, you can't do this. They could be like, oh, well, that's interesting because um, I have deeds and you can fuck off. That's, that's the extent of how that call is going to go. That's the first wave. Then the second wave is going to be rentals. When your typical landlord has to come to refinance. Your typical landlord, not the 18th century guy with the fur coat and the all that stuff. In fact, let's let's get into it, right? Let's just say, right, it's some lady called Angela. Right, let's personalise this. Let's make it accessible, guys. Let's talk about Angela. Angela is your landlord. So, Angela is a typical landlord. She came out of university in 2004 and she joined a graduate programme at fucking Pricewaterhouse Coopers, right? Big accountancy firm, good for her. She's on 30K. Then she gets promoted a couple of years in. Now she's on 43K. And it's, it's okay money, but it's not amazing for London. It's, it's all right. Anyway, her parents sell up and downsize, you know, because she's moved to London and and they buy something else, you know, they give her a fat fucking deposit, right? This is how shit works or worked or should work or, or kind of did before, right? They sell up the family home in Buckinghamshire where they move to for a good school. They sell that fucker for 900 grand or something, right? 900k because it's a family house in Buckinghamshire, say four bed, five bed, whatever, 900 grand. And then they buy this ground floor flat in what, like? Somewhere near the New Forest or Brighton or, you know, 300 grand, right? Now, that gives them... So 900 grand minus the three for the flat. That gives them 300 grand to go on cruises. <laughs> and then 300 grand to split between Angela and her shitty loser brother who wastes the whole lot on legal highs and taking his mates to Ibiza and living like a don and pissing it all away. Her brother is a loser and he comes crawling back to her years later asking for more money and it creates a huge family rift. But that's a different story. Anyway, 150 grand each, right? Boom. Angela's happy and delighted and hugely entitled and detached from the struggles of the rest of the country and obviously fuck her to hell. But that is Angela's deal. Let's move on. So she's got a fat deposit and a reasonable London salary. So she buys a flat in a soulless new build development in Docklands and everything's great. Her mortgage is totally manageable and about half what she would pay in rent. That and rates and food and a monthly tube pass. She's doing all right. Angela lives her best life because she's got, you know, two and a half grand a month from her job coming in. But then her mortgage is only like 550. And so then pretty much the rest of it. Play money, bro. Just getting fucked up. Just having fun. And most of her friends are in the same boat, right? Big deposits, cheap mortgages, nice holidays, festivals, big weekends. And God forgive them, they have conversations out loud around pub tables like this. Right? One of them will say, oh my God, Tabitha had to uh, replace her boiler and it's cost her thousands. And, uh, and her father still cut her off like after he found that cocaine baggie. Uh, so she's having to pay it all herself. And now she's only got like 13,000 in her savings now, Toby. Like, it, it, isn't it ghastly? And it is ghastly. <laughs> Guys, ghastly is the right word for talking like that out in the open. Uh, she's only got uh, 13,000 in her savings now, Toby. Because meanwhile... <laughs> Right, she has periphery friends like me and maybe you sitting on the same table listening to this shit. Like only 13 grand. Are you fucking joking? Do you people all have 13 grand just laying about? How? <laughs> and it's like only 13 grand. Like how much do the rest of you have knocking about? That's fucking lottery money to the rest of us. Fuck me. If I had 13 grand... Do you know what I would do? I'd pay you both six and a half grand each to fuck off. Like that's, that is what her periphery friends like me are thinking, but never say. Um, anyway, Angela herself is in her flat. Let's bring this back to Ange, right? She's in her flat and she's living her best life. Until she meets, say, um, this Toby guy's friend. 
right? Archie. And, uh, and Archie and Andra hit it off. You know, they like the same music. They do the same drugs. It's beautiful. And they get together and they're perfect and cute and still insufferable. But, you know, they're adorbs and togethers uh, for a year or two. Until the idea of one of them fucking someone else is, is just upsetting enough for the other one to go, we should move in together. We should, we should be a proper couple. And so they are. And they move into his place. And she rents hers out. And this is where we sort of get back to the people renting thing, right? In this soon-to-be financial crisis. Like, Angela makes a modest income off that rental. It's like an extra 200 quid a month. And her flat slowly grows in value, too. So that's cool. Good for her. But it just stays as this sort of offshoot, this kind of side investment. But now she's, quote-unquote, a landlord. And that hugely roundabout story there is most landlords in the uk they're just sort of you know property owners of circumstance they're accidental landlords almost you know they bought a flat they got on the ladder and then either that you know they hook up with somebody and move in with them or their job says oh we've got to send you out to saudi arabia for you know two years and they don't want to sell the flat they've just bought it you know so they rent it out while they're away. They are landlords or property owners of circumstance, sort of, right? Anyway, now Angela, Angela, is 10 years down the line and she's still with Archie. But that flat is there with a tenant in, paying 1200 a month or whatever. And the mortgage on it, the buy-to-let mortgage, is about to come up for renewal in March 2023. And that mortgage on a two-year fixed or an expiring five-year fixed or whatever is about to go from 600 quid a month to £1,700 a month. And Angela's tenant, who's living in the flat, let's say it's a city worker. Let's give her a name as well. Jessica. Jessica, who's trying to find her feet. Maybe Jessica has even joined the same graduate scheme that Angela joined 10 years ago. Except without the 150 grand house deposit money. Maybe Jessica is just, you know, someone like me. Or like you. When we were 24. You know, that sort of person that's gone through uni. You got an okay job with half decent prospects. You're paying eye-watering rent but sort of hoping that if you just work hard and play the game, maybe you might get on a help to buy or something further down the line. Well, that person, Jessica, is now going to get a letter that says, well, it's a, it's a difficult time for us all, but Foxton's have had to take some incredibly difficult decisions given the current market. And unfortunately, we regret to announce that your rent will increase from 1200 a month to 2400 pounds a month as of March the 1st like that is what is going to happen renting is not going to escape this it starts with bank of england borrowing rates and it you know mortgages and shit and then the second wave is the rental sector we are all fucked with this anyway what, what the fuck was i talking about before food I was talking about food before I got sidetracked with Angela and Archie. Fuck those people, honestly. Food is at its most expensive for 40 years. 40 years! But food hasn't cost this much comparatively since 1980 or some shit. And according to Sky News, this is mostly due to the war in Ukraine. Like, does it, does it seem weird to anyone else that a war in a country I'd never fucking heard of 10 years ago in my, you know, ignorant Westerner brain? <laughs> like, if, if you'd asked me to point to Ukraine on a map a couple of years ago, I'd have been like, um, there? No, no, that's that's South America, aid. <laughs> like, even now, I mean, fuck two years ago, like, even now, I wouldn't be able to point to Ukraine on a map, I don't think. Like, I know it's next to Russia, but so are some other countries, right? You know, China is next to Russia. 
fucking Germany is next to Russia. So I don't really know, you know, how can this little country have impacted the world? Like, you know, this is a country, and, and Russia, let's not the, let them off here, right, who have the ability to completely destabilise our economy. How wild is that? That just this one country, you know, has just... Like, we're just such a shit little island, aren't we? So hilariously reliant on supply chains and shipping. Like a little conflict in Ukraine. Financial Armageddon. Like, And I do question, you know, to what extent Ukraine or Putin or, or whatever can be blamed for, you know, all of the current chaos. You know, I do think they use it as a scapegoat whenever they need to oh it's a global problem guys it's it's a these are global pro like really whenever they say it's a global problem or this was caused by putin's invasion of ukraine i do kind of scoff a bit you know i mean i'm happy to deliver some blame to putin don't get me wrong i'm not a putin apologizer or whatever but i do ask the question like any any other countries Going on mad, erratic, bond buying and bond fire sale friendlies? No, it's just us, is it? Okay, right. Like, obviously, a big part of this is the, you know, the Kamikaze mini budget. We know that. Um, but in terms of food prices, you know, like I, I heard on the news a while back, uh, there's something like cooking oil. Most of it comes from Ukraine. Like, have I got that right? Sunflower oil or cooking oil or something. I'm like, okay, but it's, I mean, it's, it's only cooking oil, right? It's cooking oil. Like, doesn't it seem a bit batshit to, like, we can literally invade countries like Iraq and Afghanistan for actual oil, real oil. And we come off relatively unscathed, you know? Like, well, the Dow, the Dow Jones was down 0.0001 points this morning, but recovered by the afternoon. Something kicks off in Ukraine, cooking oil, and it's like food price explosion, likely to leave 30 million eating their own pets this, this winter. Like, like, it does feel a bit weird, doesn't it? Or is it just me? Regular oil? Nah. Cooking oil? Armageddon. <laughs> So, yeah, man, food, petrol, electric, gas, mortgages, rent, everyone is jacking up prices. Like, it's almost comical. When you think, when you think if it like, it, like, ev is everyone jacking up? Pri like, if you think about it, like, you listen to the statements that people put out. And then think about how you're positioned in all this shit. How unfair it is. It's like, well, we at Foxton's regret to announce that it's time to get paid, motherfucker. Like, rent, rents go up, right? We at Esso regret to announce that the full court prices will need to increase. And then petrol goes up. Your internet, your Wi-Fi, alcohol, train fares, they are all... Like, regrettably, we are announcing that due to market conditions, prices will need to increase. For, and then you go to your boss like, yeah, um, due to market conditions, I'm going to have to increase my salary by 130 uh, percent. No. <laughs> but but everyone else is doing it. Uh, are they? Yeah. Everything's doubled in price. Hmm. Huh. Well, we should uh, double our prices to customers too. All right, and and then will you give me a pay rise? No, no, still no. Always no. How how are you not getting this? <laughs> Don't you ever get the feeling that they like telling you no? Like they'd actually quite like to sing it to you. That's that's the vibe you get. Is that if you if, if there was no holds barred and there was no HR processes and like nothing to restrict them? Do you ever get the feeling that if you went into your boss's office? Or like your annual pay review or whatever. If you, if you work in like co-op or, you know, Vodafone or fucking BBC, like wherever it is you work, you walk in there, you're pay reviewed. You go, look, I'm uh, I'm finding it hard to, to pay rent and 
train fare and you know and food has gone up and, and then getting into work as well so I, i'm just asking you know as a reflection of my sales successes over the last year i'm just asking if i could have a modest increase from 30 to 35 thousand fucking <laughs> polka band come in <laughs> start singing no 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 sing it with me now you know the words no 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 it's just you know everything's getting so expensive so expensive and you have no recourse we're all so powerless to go well everything's like my outgoings have doubled in in cost and price so therefore i should get double my salary no but it doesn't stop does it it's like every utility in every product it's like i swear to god any fucking day now thames water i gotta knock on the door and they're gonna be like yeah you, you know that um you know that water thing that you use uh yeah well that's um that's a priceable commodity now have you uh, have you been credit checked Huh? Yeah, you, you need to have a credit rating above 700 now to get a water license. A what? Since when? Like, what, what the fuck is this? Oh, damn. I've just... I've just checked. It looks like you're at 541. Oh, unfortunately, your water is going to get shut off now. Like, I'm being a bit ridiculous. A bit, right. But honestly, what's to stop privatised water companies... From going, well, yeah, our bills have gone up too. You think we own these offices? No, these are leased and mortgaged. And we have to pay heating too. So, yeah, sozza. But we will be doubling your fucking water bill. Like, like, where is this headed? How long until everywhere is vacant and no water runs and there's no power? And it's just... Like, do you ever get to the point where you look at other countries, other places we fucking nation built, you know? All those times you heard politicians, like, we're uh, diverting another 40 billion to Afghanistan to build institutions and water processing facilities or, you know, shit like that. And then you look back at the UK in 2023, your dad shitting in a bucket while your kid's try to swallow stinging nettles quickly enough that they don't taste the stinging before it gets digested or some shit like like i look at the state of britain from over the last 20 years over the same period of time as we've like diverted all this cash overseas and the one thing i keep coming back to i keep asking myself it's like why is everything just getting shitter and shitter like aren't we supposed to be improving things like do we really need to get get like so bad we need to let stuff spiral out of control so badly you know sewage everywhere electric shut off water becomes an opulent fantasy does it, does it have to get so bad that we call in our own nation building teams <laughs> like the un putting cordoning tape around your house and yeah the uh, sanitary uh, works here is not up to un standards any longer it's going to take a immediate emergency team to come in helicopters flying in this is it man i mean how long until some of these third world countries like rwanda right we look at it like this it's this sort of third world country that we ship our immigrants off to cruelly and mean-spiritedly right how long until a country like rwanda looks at the uk and goes I mean, this is just inhumane. We're going to have to send in some some UN teams to to help nation build this place with its lack of clean water and its shut off power. <coughs> Excuse me. I mean, look, I like to sit here and moan and rant, obviously. But look, have you ever sat back and looked at Britain over the last twenty years? Like everything from the removal of public toilets, you know. Like, you used to be able to just nip downstairs at Liverpool Street and take a piss for free. It's gone. You know? No public toilets in that area now. Why? Why? Like, who decided that that wasn't a necessity? Well, I guess we'll just get rid of them. Won't, won't people who really need a piss just piss in the street? Yeah, whatever, you know. Bin collections have halved. House prices out of control. 
houses themselves shit equality higher taxes than ever schools underfunded hospitals buckling ambulance queues like everything every facet of modern life is just ugh, why is it worse now you know and it isn't helped by this you know detached deluded daily mail reading boomer generation going god these bloody youngsters today nobody wants to work anymore they all just want to hand it to them on the plates you know it's like look back at the last 20 years it's not that i want stuff handed to me on a plate i just want things to stop deteriorating is that too much to ask that's all i want is just to see some sign of societal improvement <laughs> some glimmer of hope the property might be getting you know comparatively cheaper for people not even for me just for the next generation to have something as basic as a roof over your head like achievable attainable oh youngsters just want it handed to them oh well let's just leave things in a state of endless hard labor and weeping sorrow no improvement lest you feel you might have worked harder than you needed to in some decade gone by. I'm like, you know, maybe we should build some more houses. Then they come out with shit like, sorry, Britain's full. No, it's not. It's 98% unbuilt on, you fucking idiot. That is a fact. 98% of the country is unbuilt on. And then they're like, well, no, sorry. It's, uh, well, it's all about hard work and sacrifice, isn't it? You want something? you got to stay in for a decade. No! You are... Do you think that's normal? To have to stay in? Like, veritable imprisonment so that you are rewarded with something as basic as a roof over your head? You think that's normal? You are fucking traumatised. It's not a normal reaction to something. If you've gone through hardship, if you were made to slave away for years, for a fucking decade, the correct response to seeing that corrected should be well good i don't i don't want our kids to have to go through that you know no one should ever have to go through that i remember what it was like for me and it was grueling and i don't want the next generation to have to suffer in the way that i have to. like that is a normal reaction it's a pretty um callous mean-spirited response if you're like well, it happened to me, so now I shall bequeath this pain and chaos to you, dear boy. Like, are you a sociopath? Are you a fucking paedophile? Because honestly, that is what paedophiles do. They get molested in childhood. They're traumatised and psychologically they normalise what happened to them. To the point where they think it's okay to do it to somebody else. Like, what's the, what's the saying? Like, the abused go on to abuse. Or the abused abuse, right? Because they think that it's normal. It's been normalised. You've been traumatised. If you had to slave away in a warehouse for 10 years, doing nothing but eating your own shit and, you know, saving and scrimping and sacrificing to get your foot on the ladder, I am truly sorry that that happened to you. That is awful. But that doesn't mean that you get to go, uh, you know, well, I was kid-fucked by society, so now you too shall be kid-fucked. Take your pants off. That is, that is what you are. If that's you, you are a fiscal paedophile. And I know that's a hard message to hear, but fuck, man. This isn't the Sesame Street podcast. I'm not here to sugarcoat this. Give you the Disney TG rated version. I don't have to adhere to the production notes of impartial BBC stage management or whatever. Like, some people talk the talk. Some people come out with a, you know, watery, half assed thing. Like, you know, they'll come out with well, a lot of the housing crisis is brought on by boomers i don't fuck around if that's what you are if you're the one oh i had to work hard so you two too i call you what you are you're a fucking fiscal pedophile guys that's it uh who's coming out next thursday let's get booge it's the first patreon meetup it's thursday the 27th of october in london there's still time to get involved just jump on patreon.com forward slash aid thompson the cheapest tier on there by the way is three quid a month to join my goddamn cult and it is a cult i need total devotion long-term religious levels of protection <laughs> against cancel culture so that when 
you know, like inevitably when someone drags this podcast through the mud, you know, he, he used the wrong description of this group of people or, you know, he used domestic violence as a metaphor for clinging on and defending a political party that continues to abuse the victim. Like, he used that as a metaphor, which means he's mocking domestic violence victims. Ergo, cancelled jail. Like, when, when they come for me, which they almost certainly will do, I require cult-like levels of devotion. I am preparing myself for that shit with a pre-cancel culture tactic of creating my, you know, full-on influencer cult here. Uh, at patreon.com forward slash aid thompson anyway unlike other cults there are actually some benefits uh, to this one if you jump on the patreon you will get first listen to all podcasts that's two days ahead of everyone else two days before mere mortals on spotify and apple uh, you get access to our discord chat which you know we talk about tories we talk shit about them we mock them we lampoon them uh, that's that's open to you also. We have a live, in-person, Binfluencer cult meetup. That's next Thursday, I mentioned. Um, oh, and you get credited at the end of shows. So I'll read your name out as a supporter, a specific backer of the show. And, and you know what? For being an all-round good egg. That's what you get a shout-out for. So actually, we can do that now. Should we do that? Let's do it. So thank you very much to David V, um, Alex S, Alex, uh, sorry, Aaron, uh, Alex. Wait, there's two Alexes. I'll start again. Uh, David V, Alex S, Aaron, Alex T, Christy, Rax, Ricardo, Silent, T-Rex, Oliver, Sarah, Paul and Kerry. Thank you so much for supporting uh, the show, guys. It means the world to me. Super psyched to be meeting, uh, hopefully, hopefully most of you next thursday night and if you are keen to jump on the patreon and you haven't done yet if you jump on there in the next couple of days you will still get the invite to next thursday um oh also if you jump on the this right so there's three tiers right three quid five quid and ten quid now the ten quid one is a bit outrageous i don't expect anyone to jump on that but if you did decide to i do a monthly skype call with the 10 pound premium tier people and we're just going to talk shit have a beer you can ask me anything you like uh that's for the 10 pound ones um for five pounds you get uh all of the first look access and the invites to the meetups uh for the three pound ones you, you get uh discord chat access and also early access to uh to the podcast too um that's it guys uh i'm back friday night with a guested show with dr robert bush uh, he and I were talking about COVID, about the pandemic, looking back on that period and and whether we have much faith, really, in the future of uh, humankind. Uh, if you here's, here's my prelude for that episode. If you feel like you have a little bit too much optimism, if you feel a bit too enthusiastic about the prospects of the human race, maybe chuck it on. It You know, it might bring you down a few pegs. Um, so that's this Friday. That'll be out to Patreons and then it'll go out to everyone else on Sunday. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back soon. Until next time, we outie.